Hi, this is Dr. Shana Roselle. I am a hematologist oncologist with Affiliated Oncology out of Chicago, Illinois. Today, we'll be discussing metastatic breast cancer. This is MD Newsline. How has the prognosis changed on patients with metastatic breast cancer? Well, I would say over the years, we've had a lot of uh, development of different types of therapies. When I was in training, and I might look young, but when I was in training, at that time, it was really offering only endocrine therapy. And so patients were receiving either fovestrin, they were receiving aromatase inhibitors, and, and that was pretty much it. But we learned that there were other ways that patients or that cancers developed a resistance. And they developed resistance by a mechanism called the CDK46 um, uh, mutation. And so we have inhibitors uh, that were developed. Um, there are three that are on the market now. Um, one of them was um, pribocyclib, also known as Ibrands. We have ribocyclib, also known as Virzinio, and um, amebocyclib, also known as Virzinio. And so with the advent of these three CDK4-6 inhibitors, we now have learned that the progression-free survival has uh, significantly improved. And so patients who had, for instance, a progression-free survival of roughly 12 months have now extended up to 24 months. When you talk about overall survival, even with the uh, ribocyclic or Kiskali, it is pretty much now the only uh, CDK4-6 in uh, CDK4 inhibitor that has shown a significantly overall survival of about five years. Um, and so we have definitely come a long way uh, in terms of of, of improving the care and the overall survival of these metastatic patients. So how do I integrate clinical biomarkers or genomic tools? So in patients who have early stage breast cancer, and when you're determining whether or not the patient has a higher risk of recurrence, we first use our genomic risk scores. And these are, again, mama print or uh, uncle type. They are tools that were developed in these patients who are hormone positive that offers information on what's the patient's risk of recurrence. If the patient's risk of recurrence is high, then in these patients, I would also be offering adjuvant chemotherapy. And if the patient's risk of recurrence is low, then I would be offering endocrine therapy alone. These together kind of help me determine whether the patient has a higher risk of recurrence. Now, sometimes you may wonder, well, what if that patient's number, for instance, is in the middle? Then the provider is actually using their clinical judgment. And so that, along with some of the clinical features, uh, some, sometimes you are determining with the patient's age. All of those kind of help you determine whether the patient has a higher risk of recurrence. So how might liquid biopsies or circulating tumor cells benefit these patients? I would say they're definitely beneficial and they're controversial. Um, so liquid biopsies are definitely needed. Uh, it is important to use them, especially when patients are not able to undergo uh, tissue biopsies. So I think they have a place. I think they are definitely used in conjunction with uh, tissue biopsies and giving you more information about the patient. Uh, many of these patients um, develop mutations that were not initially seen um, in their initial um, biopsy diagnosis. And so if you actually find a new mutation, again, there is potentially a new therapy that may be beneficial. Similarly, when you're looking at circulating tumor cells, although not approved in this manner, um, they are also helpful to, to determine whether the patient is actually responding. So sometimes you may have a patient who has a very high circulating tumor cell um, amount in their blood, and then with the treatment that they've received, you have a way to actually determine that they're responding. And this is something that may be done a little bit earlier than, for instance, imaging or CT scans may be. So I think it is a way of the world that we will be seeing more uh, liquid uh, liquid biopsies performed, we will be again seeing more circulating tumor cells uh, testing down the line. All right, so what are some new um, treatments for metastatic breast cancer, uh, hormone positive, HER2 negative that are on the horizon? What I would say is there are a lot of new therapies that are available. And I believe that they will continue to develop. So some of the ones that you are aware of that are hard in the press, our fast trastuzumab, um, which has shown a significant response in patients who are 
hormone positive HER2 low metastatic breast cancer. You also have uh, other ADCs such as satsuzumab, govotecan, um, who again, these ADCs have shown promising therapy. But what about the other targeted therapies? There is uh, L-acestrant, um, which targets ESR1. There is capivastrotib, which also targets your P10. Um, there is al alpalacib, which also targets your PIC3CA ray, PIC ray three, uh, three uh, mutations. All of these um, have, again, shown a lot of promise uh, in treating these patients. And so I do foresee continued um, development of new drugs, novel therapies that kind of inhibit those uh, resistance mechanisms in those patients. So to take home, what I would say is that metastatic breast cancer, hormone positive, there are lots of new advances in treatment. Um, you have, again, targeted therapies, you have your CDK4-6 inhibitors, you have the role of endocrine therapy, as well as uh, a development of newer, newer targets, such as your ADCs. Um, patients, again, are doing well. Um, they're doing much better than we could even have, have imagined um, previously in the past. And I expect that to continue to occur in the future. Um, what I would encourage you to, to do is to really have that conversation with your, your patients, uh, making sure that they understand that this is not absolutely a death sentence, that there are so many different new strategies. Um, and if you can develop a comprehensive approach, um, making sure that they actually have the support, I do think they will actually do extremely well.